Christ's head is uncompromising in doctrine, unmovable by distractors, uncommon in dedication, unchanged in his declaration. Brothers and sisters, hear him and be blessed. Obey him and you make heaven at the end. I don't know how to present him the more. He's a great man of God. He is God's general. And tonight, in appreciation of what he has done, I will appreciate that this audience will rise up. Amen. Amen. As I present unto you tonight the Bible teacher, an expository minister of the word of God, the general superintendent of Deepa Crystal Life Ministry, and our great man of God, Pastor W. Kumuyi. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. For all of us who are connected by satellite to the Bible story tonight, this is the capital of your state. And um, we have finished our study of the book of Revelation. And we're starting a new book today. And to think about it. That the very first study in the new book is taking place at Ibadan or your state. Praise the Lord. Those of us who are over there on you watching by satellite, I wish you were here. What my ears have heard and what my eyes have seen. Anyway, when you get connected to me, I'll be telling you stories about your state. Praise the Lord. We're here to study the Bible tonight. Are you ready to study with me? Where is your Bible now? Raise it up. See how many Bibles we have here. With these many Bibles here, we have defeated the devil already. Keep it up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We bless your name because you've gathered us together. We come to study your word. And we pray that the study of your word will bring blessings for everybody in Jesus' name. I pray that this will be a great day in the life of every one of us. And I pray, oh Lord, the study of your word will move us on in the path of duty. In the path of responsibility. We will do your will. We will do your work. And Lord, we're going to be rewarded in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Please sit down in the blessing of the Lord. Tonight, as I announced to you, we're starting a new series in our Bible study. And we're looking at the book of Jonah. And tonight we're looking at Jonah chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Jonah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a sheep going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. If you have been with us over this weekend, when we had our freedom celebration, you will see the Lord has led us into freedom. And then last night, as we brought the freedom celebration to a conclusion, we asked the question, now that you are free, what next? 
Now that you are saved, what next? Now that you have received the Lord, and you have received the word of the Lord, and the strength and the might and the power of the Lord in your life, what next? Now that the Lord has showered his abundance of blessing upon your life, and the Lord has opened your cage, and you have come out of that cage, and now you live in the freedom where we is Christ has made you free, what next? That's why we come to the book of Jonah. You come into the kingdom, and then you go on behalf of the king. You have repented, and therefore you go to tell other people about Christ, so that you can repent. Here we have Jonah. It says, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The son of Amittai. Now, we know something about Jonah already. It was the one that the Lord called. And he told him where to go. Arise and go to Nineveh. He arose. And then he went the opposite direction. And you will remember in the story of the prodigal son. He also arose and he went to a far country. That's why this man, Jonah, is referred to as a prodigal prophet. Because he led the will of God. He led the work of God. He led the word of God. The will and the work and the word of the Lord he led. And then he went in another direction. As we look at this prodigal prophet, thank God. He was not forever lost because the Lord brought him back. If somebody backslides, he goes away from the Lord. If he does not return back, he's not a prodigal son. He's dead, he's lost, and he's not recovered. When somebody backslides and the grace of God brings him back and he comes back into the kingdom, that's when you call him prodigal son, prodigal daughter. If he dies in the far country, it's lost forever. If he dies in the field or country of disobedience and rebellion, he's dead and lost forever. But when the Lord has mercy on him, and then he calls him back. Then that's the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. There are some theologians, there are some people, some scholars that feel that the story of Jonah is not a real story. That is an allegory. It's an illustration. It's something that the Old Testament people put together just to teach a particular lesson. But that's not true. Because we know that Jonah actually had an existence. If you look at Second Kings chapter 14, you will see him mentioned there. Second Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He restored the course of Israel from the entry of Hamas unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath Hefer. And so, from the Old Testament, you can see, Jonah was a man that lived at a particular time. He was a servant of God. He was a prophet of the Lord. And he administered successfully and faithfully and fruitfully over there in the land of Israel. Now the Lord gave him a new assignment. Well, Jesus also referred to Jonah. If you look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. You will see from verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees and such saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of 
of the prophet Jonas. You will see that Jesus referred to Jonah as an historical figure. It's not a fictitious figure. It's not just somebody that appeared in a parable, in a story, in an illustration, an historical figure. In verse 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment of this generation and shall condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. A greater than Jonas is here. What's the significance of that? The Lord will not compare himself with a man in a parable. The Lord will not compare himself with an unreal man. With a man that never existed, a man that was just named in an allegory, but he compared himself with Jonas, and he said, A greater than Jonas is here. Look at verse 42 and the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for the for she came from the uttermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon was real. And Christ compared himself to Solomon. He contrasted actually himself with Solomon. And he said, a greater than Solomon is here. And a greater than Jonas is here. If Solomon was a real man at a particular time, the son of David. Then Jonah was also a real man. The son of Amittai. Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 29. Luke chapter 11 verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto, unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And so we know that Jonah was a real figure, a real personality, actually a prophet of the Lord in the Old Testament. Please come back to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. If you know anything about the Old Testament people, their names were very significant. Their names were very important. Their names were very instructive. Their names were very, very much illustrative of what the Lord was calling them to. You think about Abraham, what a significant name. And you think about Moses, what a significant name. And then you have many other names like that in the Old Testament. How about the name of Jonah? The name of Jonah, the meaning of Jonah is a dove, a dove. And when you think about a dove, there are two things that you'll find, one in the Old Testament, the other one in the New Testament concerning a dove. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jonah a dove. Jonah a dove in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, behold, I send you forth. As sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless and gentle and merciful and compassionate and tender as doves. And so, as we look at the name of Jonah, he was supposed to be harmless and gentle and merciful and compassionate and loving and considerate. And so Jonas, God then picked on Jonah and said, Jonah, aren't you a dove? 
aren't you harmless? I'm going to send you to a place. So the harm, the judgment that is to come upon them will not be upon them because you'll give them warning. Another thing that we find about the dove, you find that in Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. And I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 11. We roar all like bears and mourn so like doves. We look for judgment but there is none for salvation but it is far off from us. Another thing we learned about the dove is that it mourns. Blessed are they that mourn because they shall be comforted. Nineveh was very, very sinful and it touched the heart of the almighty God and God said, Jonah, you are a dove. And the dove mourns. Why do, you, why do we mourn like the dove? Because there should be justice and there is none in Nineveh. And there should be salvation, but there was none in Nineveh. And salvation is far away from them. Because of that Jonah, a mourning dove, go to them. And go and tell them the word of the Lord. Please come back to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, that word, that word or that name, Amittai, means the truth or my truth. Actually, Amittai stands for the truth of the Lord. And Jonah, the dove, was the son of the truth of the Lord. And therefore, Jonah, by your name, Jonah, by your father's name, you are to be the portrait and the preacher and the one that goes about spreading the truth of the Lord because Amittai means my truth, the truth of the Lord. In Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, here is what the servant of the Lord should be involved in, like Jonah. Malachi chapter 2 verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. And was afraid before my name. The law of truth is, was in his mouth. The law of truth was in his mouth. Jonah, remember your name. And remember your father's name. You are the son of my truth. And because you are the son of my truth, carry my truth. Precious truth. And take it to the people of Nineveh and tell them you shouldn't die in your sin because the truth will set you free. Stand up to your name and stand up to the meaning and the significance of your name. The law of truth was found in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many from their iniquity by the instrumentality of the truth. Jonah, you will take that truth and you will go to Nineveh and you will turn many unto righteousness away from the iniquity for the priest leaves should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. As we look at Jonah then we discover number one Jonah actually lived at a particular time. I've read that to you in first in second Kings chapter 14. Number two, he was swallowed up by a whale. Jesus confirmed that. Number three, he was vomited out alive. Symbolizing, depicting, illustrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, he went to Nineveh and he preached unto them the word of God. Which he had earlier originally refused to preach. And then number five, Jesus confirmed it that the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, the divine directive. The divine directive. Number two, it's a deliberate 
disobedience. A deliberate disobedience. Then, number three, a downward destination. Downward destination. Let's come back to number one. The divine directive. A directive is a commission. A commission is a commandment. And it is an imperative. And it actually says, Jonah, this is what you are to do. Once again, I remind you, now that you are free, what next? What's the goal of your life? What's the purpose of your life? What direction are you going to go in life? You see, there are many people, they are searching, what shall I do? This life of mine. I am in my 20s. What shall I do in life? I am in my 30s, in my 40s. I am in my 70s. What shall I do in life? Because if your life does not have a purpose, a pursuit, and your life does not have a program, then you live for nothing. And at the end of the day, at the end of your life, you will look back and then put your finger in your mouth of regret. What have I done in life? What have I achieved in life? By the time you are getting near the grave and you are about to go, then you say, what life have I lived? What goal did you live for? What desire did you have in your life? What was the plan and the purpose and the program of your life? In the case of Jonah, he didn't need to worry. What am I going to do in life? Almighty God spoke to him. The word of the Lord came to him and said, Jonah, are you wondering what to do? Are you wondering what to live for? Are you wondering the plan, the purpose, the program of life? I'm giving it to you. Here is it. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now that you are free, now that you are saved, now that you have become a child of God, what next? A divine directive. Actually, as you look at this, God gave directives to people. And if you are listening to the Lord, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, the Lord will give you a divine directive. When God gave Jeremiah a divine directive, he said, I am too young. When God gave Moses a divine directive, it's like, I am not qualified, I'm a stammerer, and I'm too old. When two thoughts of your life has gone, 80 years of age, and the Lord said, Moses, all these 80 years, what did you live for? Now I'm going to give you something to live for. Rise up. And go back to Egypt and deliver the children of Israel. A divine directive that God will come to you today. And God will tell you how to spend the rest of your life. Yeah. What a wonderful privilege that will be. Then you will know, I'm not wasting my life. I am not wasting my time. I am in the very center of the will of God because I've received a divine directive. But... That divine directive, there are times it's tough to carry it out. And yet, if you rise up and you're willing to carry it out, the grace of the Lord will help you. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, divine directive. 2 Samuel chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. You see, Jonah had a problem. The problem he had is these people of uh, Nineveh, they were wicked. They were cruel. They were destructive. And they were murderers. And they could do anything. And because of the fear, what will people say? Because of the fear, what will the people do? Because of the fear, what will be the result? If I go there and this happens and this happens and this happens and I'm alone there, there is nothing to be afraid of. Underneath you are the everlasting arms and he that abides under the shadow of the Almighty, he will dwell in that place and then he will say, the Lord is my refuge. What shall I fear? What man, what can man do to you? Then we're told 
the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him. And he said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except save only one little ewe lamb, which he, he had brought, he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him. And with his children, and he did eat of his own meat and drank of, out of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and his spear to take of his own flock, and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the, for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this sin shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this sin and because he had no mercy, he had no pity. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. He sent him, the Lord sent him to David, a great king. And see the kings of those days, if you give them a message that they didn't want to accept, you could be killed. But Nathan feared God more than King David. The one that has sent you is the one to fear. You are not to fear the people you are sent to. That was the problem of Jonah. He was afraid of the Ninevites that he was sent to. And he wasn't afraid of the almighty God. In the case of Nathan, he went to David and he said, Thou art the man. The Lord is sending you today and you will go. In 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, the child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass that when the king Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. You see, the reason why people behave like Jonah. And God sends them to go and deliver a message. And they cannot deliver the message. The reason is that they are afraid. What if the king, what if the people I'm sent to will lay hand on me? And then they will hurt me and tear me apart. There is nothing to worry. Because the almighty God himself who has sent you. The almighty God who sends you to those Ninevites, who sends you to those sinners, he'll back you up. And because he will back you up, there is nothing for you to fear. Because the almighty God, he will go with you. He will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And so you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What shall men do? Unto me, when the Lord has sent you to do something, go ahead and get it done. And do not allow the fear of man to be a snare unto you. The word of the Lord came unto these people and they obeyed the word of the Lord. You will obey the word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me. What a wonderful thing. It came to Jonah. It came to Nathan. 
And it came to the prophet that came to Bezel. And it came now to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified, set thee apart. And I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Then I said, then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. I cannot speak, I am a child. I am inexperienced. And because of lack of experience, and because of my young age, I cannot do what you are calling me to do. And then the Lord said in verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go. Thou shalt go. And there's something you are going to learn about God. That when God wants you to do something, even though you say no, that does not release you. Even though you give excuse, that does not release you. Even though you say, I will fail, that will not excuse you. Even though you say, I don't have the experience, I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the resources, I don't have the power, I don't have the courage, I don't have the confidence, I've never done this before, I cannot make it. All the excuses you can give in the world will not excuse you. It still says, he has sent you, he has appointed you, here is what to do. We learn that from the book of Jonah. God called Jonah. And he felt it wasn't something he could do. And he went the opposite direction. And all that will not release him. What the Lord has called him to do, he still must do. Verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Please come back to Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Let's see the command. Let's see the commission. Let's see the imperative. The thing that God told Jonah he had to do. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Arise, that's one. Go, that's two. Cry against it, that's number three. As Jonah will arise from his place, then he will go in the right direction. And then he will proclaim. He will cry against Nineveh because of their sin. And the Lord Jesus has given us that same great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if you are sitting down every time and you are not arising, how do you do that? And you are not going... How will you do what the Lord has said? And when you go, there's something to do. Cry against it. What does that mean? Cry against it. Look at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58. You arise, you go, and you cry against it. Isaiah 58 from verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. That's what Jonah was to do. Cry aloud. Lift up your voice like that of a trumpet and reveal and show my people their sin and their transgression. Yet yeah, they seek me daily. And they'd like to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching unto God. And yet they were still sinners cry aloud unto them. Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Cry aloud. Cry against it because of the sins thereof. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, go cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Lift up your voice. 
Look at them face to face. Declare unto them their sin. And tell them God is angry. Well, the sinner every day called them out of their sin. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness. No more holiness. But in the past, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of, of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, says the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and have become vain. The challenge Jeremiah was to give to the people of Judah is that they had gone away from the Lord. They had offended the Lord. And then the Lord was saying, can you justify your backsliding? Can you justify your evil? Can you justify your disobedience and rebellion? What evil have your fathers found in me that you have gone far away from me? Look at verse 11. As a nation changed their gods, which yet are no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished to ye heavens at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Jonah was to cry against Nineveh. And Jeremiah was doing the same thing. And when you do this, you do this in the power of the Holy Ghost. Micah chapter 3. In Micah chapter 3, verse 8. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. The reason why we are filled with the Holy Ghost, and we have the power of the Holy Ghost, and we have the courage and the might of the Holy Ghost is that we can go to the sinners. Whether it's an individual sinner, or sinners in a community, or sinners in a city, or sinners in a country. Go to the sinners and declare unto them the word of the Lord, the word of salvation. That you have gone astray. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. But thank God... The gift of eternal life we find in Christ. And then you invite them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ so they can have the forgiveness of their sin. Micah said, for this reason I am full of the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might. To declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. What the Lord has told us to do, we shall do. I said we shall do. Come back to Jonah chapter 1 verse 2. Arise, go. Arise, go. Anytime somebody comes to the Lord, that is the commission. Go. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. How be Jesus suffered him not, but says unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell how great things the Lord has done for thee and has had compassion on thee. Arise, go over this weekend during the freedom celebration. The Lord has set you free, has broken your chain. 
and destroy the works of the devil in your life. And because the Lord has set you free, you are not to just hold on to the blessing and keep on sitting in church singing amazing grace. I'll switch the sound. Arise go and go and tell other people, tell your friends what the Lord has done for you in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out to the highways and to the hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. You don't only tell your friends in the house, in your neighborhood, you go to the streets and you go to the highways. This is the challenge the Lord is bringing to us that the revival of evangelism will start again. In the bus, in the taxi, in the school, in the college, in the hospital, in the prison, anywhere in the highways and the streets, you will go and tell the people to come in to the kingdom of God. We're looking at Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, in verse 43, and he said unto me, unto them, I must Preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Number one, in your neighborhood, to your friends. Number two, to the streets and the highways and the byways, to the strangers. Number three, to the cities also. You go from city to city. You go from region to region. You go from local government to local government. You go from province to province. And you go everywhere to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. That's what the Lord did. And that's what he's expecting us to do. We shall do it. I said we shall do it. Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 36, and Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. That's what we call popularity. It became popular in that community. And then Simon Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, said, All men are looking for you. They respect you. They appreciate you. They love you. Let's stay here. Because all men are looking for you. Verse 38. And he said unto them, Let us, what? Go to the next towns. Don't remain in one place. Let us go to the next towns. You see, uh, pastors that have large churches, when your church has grown to 200 or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000, you fill up the whole of your time with ministration in that local church because it's a growing church. People want counseling. People want instruction. People want direction. People want celebration. People want you to name their children. People want to, uh, you to get involved in the wedding. They want you to get involved in the burial. They want you to stay there. And if anybody wants to do wedding, they say, no, if our pastor is not there, I will shoot my date of wedding. Because we love our pastor so much, he must be the one to preach in my wedding. And then you are tied down. If the choir is going to choose a song, you must be there. If they are going to play, you must be there. Anything that has been done, pastor, everybody appreciates this local pastor. And they say, all men seek for thee. Pastor, you have not come to the children's section. The children are looking for you. You have not come to the youth section. The youths are looking for you. You have not come to the women's section. The women are saying, when are you going to give us a program? Stay here. But Jesus said, we cannot stay in one location all our life. Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore am I sent forth. I came forth. And so the Lord is telling us there is work to do and we shall do it. And you will do it in Jesus name. Mark chapter 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world. Don't stay in one location. Plant the churches. Here we have a big city. Do some survey 
and find out why we don't have a church, a locality, a community where we don't have a church, plant a church there. Go beyond the city, go to the next towns and go to the local government and go to the provinces and go everywhere because that's the reason we're sent forth. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Other people did it, we will do it. I come to point number two. The Lord called Jonah. And you would have thought because of the experience of Jonah and because Jonah was not new to the ministry, immediately the Lord called him, you thought he will rise up and do what he was supposed to do. Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord with there for a moment a deliberate disobedience the Lord said arise and go and he told him where to go and get him there he told him what to do and yet deliberately intentionally purposefully he rose up and then he went the opposite direction he rose up to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. And then we're told in chapter 4 of that same Jonah, chapter 4, verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before thee unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. I knew that if I went to Nineveh, those people may repent. And the enemies of Israel, when they repent, I know you are such a compassionate, merciful, loving God. You will forgive them. And then you will not destroy them again. That's why I ran away. What's your reason for running away from the Lord? What's your reason for disobeying the word of the Lord? He has called you. Arise and go. And take the watch of the good news, the gospel, and go and tell the sinners, they don't have to perish, they can be saved. Why are you not doing it in your office? Why didn't you tell your boss? Why didn't you tell your colleagues in the place of work? Why didn't you tell your mother until she's about to die now and you are not telling her how to be saved? How to give a life to the Lord. Why are you not telling your father? Why are you not telling your brothers and sisters? Jonah had a reason. He didn't want the people to get what he had got. The mercy that he had got. The mercy that the Israelites have got. He didn't want the Ninevites to have that same mercy. And then he wasn't the only person. There are many people having different reasons for having deliberate disobedience. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 8 and 9. For since I speak, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the watch of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. And that was a problem that confronted Jeremiah. You know, sometimes when you're preaching the gospel, and then you, maybe it's during the morning cry, and you raise your voice, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. Repent and turn to the Lord. And you do it and early in the morning when it's very cold, you are sweating. Because you are putting all your energy into it. Because of the conviction you have that judgment is coming. And then during the day, somebody meets you. And while he meets you, instead of saying, good morning, sir, good morning, ma. Then he says, judgment is coming. And then he begins to laugh. And then you feel small. You feel little. 
You feel depressed. You feel discouraged. You feel despised. Because they're using the word you're preaching and they're throwing it back at you. And it becomes a reproach. It becomes degradation. It becomes something that the people that do not believe the Lord, that they take in their mouth to ridicule you. And then for that reason, you may then want to shut up and say, I cannot preach it anymore because the word of the Lord has become a reproach unto me. Look at verse 9. Then said I, I will not make mention of him because of the reproach and because of the ridicule and because of the jesting and because of the name, nickname that he gave to him. He said, I won't do this anymore. I will not speak. I will not make mention of him. Nor speak anymore in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. So he rose up and then he went out to preach again. What is closing your mouth? Is it because when you first got to that place of work, you were preaching? And then, after you started preaching for some time, your boss and everybody else, they said, Ah, this place is not church. This one is not crusade field. This one is for work. All this preaching, preaching, huh? it will affect your promotion. And then at the end of the maybe a financial year, they promoted all the others. Even the people that are not working as hard as you are working. And then they left you behind. And then you are wondering, why are they doing like this to me? Ah, they say, you, you are a preacher now. Your reward is in heaven. And then, ah, uh, uh, I must be reasonable. I must not be doing like this again if I want promotion here. And then, now you are quiet. Now you cannot talk. But the word of God is still inside you like fire. You will rise up again. Yeah. And you will speak boldly in the name of the Lord in Jesus' name. Yeah. It tells us in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his son to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. God has called you and God has called you to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And no man having put his son to the plow and looking back getting discouraged, getting depressed, abandoning the work the Lord has given you. I'm not, I don't mean the work in the church. I'm talking of going, going, and preaching the gospel to the people outside. When you abandon that, it says, then you are not fit for the kingdom. It tells us in, for Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. For Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 10. Here we are looking at the word of the Lord concerning Saul. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying, It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. What's the Lord saying about you tonight, believer, brother, sister? What's the Lord saying to the angels concerning you? What's the heavenly father telling the Lord Jesus Christ concerning you? I raised him up to be a soul winner. I raised her up to be a soul winner. I saved her as the first person in her family. So I can use her to tell other members of the family. But I regret that I didn't pick another person before her. Because she's so afraid. And she's so timid. She cannot tell her mother. She cannot tell her father. And she cannot tell the other people in the family. It repented me that I've chosen Saul to be king in Israel. Because he has not 
obeyed my commandments. And then we're told in verse 22, and Samuel said, as the Lord has great delight in bunch offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. What does that mean? To obey is better than sacrifice. You might say, I'm serving the Lord. I'm spending my time. I'm giving my money. I'm making sacrifices. You know what I'm doing in the church? Yes, but you work, you have more work outside. How many people do we have in the church? I'm a house fellowship leader. How many people in that house fellowship? I'm a zona leader. How many people in that, in that zone? I'm a district coordinator. How many people in that district? There are more people outside than inside. And although you are sacrificing inside the church, there is the obedience to the great commission. Take the gospel outside where the people are. And to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And I was because I feared the people. I feared the people. I feared the people. That's always the root cause of disobedience. When the Lord has called you to do something, I feared the people. The Lord is calling the pastor and is saying, why don't you have a citywide crusade in your city? I'm not talking of GS. You don't have to wait for GS before you have citywide crusade. The Lord is calling us, why don't we plant church somewhere? I feared the people. If I raise that kind of issue in this church, the people are going to confront me and they're going to say, Pastor, we are doing this in the church. Where's the money we're going to spend on having a citywide crusade? And we're supposed to do this in the church. This year now, Pastor, you have not had youth program. You have not had workers program. You have not had this one. You have not had this one. And you are bringing up this again. And when the people confront their pastor like that, then the pastor will go into a shell. Because you see, if you are not free from fear, you will not be released to do what the Lord has called you to do. I feared the people, he said, and I obeyed their voice. It may be like a committee in the church that the pastor is afraid of. And there may be some very vocal, aggressive people in those committees. And when the pastor says, now, we're going to have evangelism week this week. Everybody, we're going to go out two by two. And we're going to win souls. And the pastor or the corner of his eyes will be looking at that man who is a vocal, aggressive speaker in that committee. And if the fellow does not talk, he'll be very happy. If the fellow raises up his hand, now he says, I'm in trouble. And then the fellow will say, Pastor, this kind of zeal and this kind of aggressive evangelism, see, we're suffering. You have not given us enough time for counseling. And a lot of people in the church, let me tell you, pastor, they're complaining. Days, 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 days. And then, already the pastor is becoming like a jellyfish. Very, very much afraid now. Because that fellow that doesn't listen to the spirit of God. And he all, only uses his own ideas in his own mind. Because he's talking now. That's the reason now the pastor is going to be afraid. And the pastor cannot say, my friend, there's only one pastor in the church. And the Lord has spoken to me. And the Lord has said, what we're going to do at this time, the church will rise up. And we're going to have organized evangelism. This is how we're going to do it. My friend, please sit down. God bless you. I'm saying your pastor. And then the fellow will sit down. But fear will not allow. 
the pastor to take the initiative and do what the Lord has called the church to do and go and preach the gospel to every creature. I pray that the Lord will deliver us from the fear of man in Jesus' name. I need a good amen. If you don't say the amen well, I'll make you to rise up and say it. The Lord will deliver us from the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Now, you see that was a problem of Saul because he feared the people. That's why he went back from the commission the Lord had given him. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. If you live by fear, you will not be just. Neither are you going to remain justified when you live by fear. The just shall live not by fear. The just shall live by faith. And if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. I said we are not of them who draw back to perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. In, in um, Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 25 Hebrews 12 25 see that she refuse not him that speaketh for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Not slavish fear. Not human fear. Not the fear of our members, but godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. In Job chapter 34, deliberate disobedience. I pray God will save us from it. God will cleanse away disobedience from our lives. Job chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 26. Job 34, verse 26. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. That's why judgment came upon Jonah. And that's why judgment comes upon many people today. Because they will not regard the word of the Lord. Because they turn back from him. And will not consider any of his ways. So that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him. And he hears the cry of the afflicted. When he giveth quietness, who can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him? Whether it be done against a nation or against a man only, that the hypocrite reign not, lest the people be ensnared. Surely it is me to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. 
You see, coming from verse 26, it said, the Lord has been striking the people as the wicked. You see the way he dealt with Jonah. Because he abandoned the will of God, the work of God, the watch of God. And now it says, it's because they turned back from him. And because they will not consider any of his ways. That's why the prayer comes in verse 31. Surely it is, it is necessary. It is suitable. It is fit. It is meet to be said unto God. I have borne chastisement. I will not offend anymore. Can you say that after me? I will not offend anymore. I want to hear you well. I will not offend anymore. Offend. Say this after me. That which I see not. That which I see not. Teach thou me. If I have done iniquity. I will do no more. It's a great iniquity for you to see somebody's house burning and you have the strength and you have the knowledge and you have everything it takes to pull him out of the fire and then you leave him there. The people of the world are going to burn in hell fire and it's a great iniquity and a great sin and you see them getting into that fire of hell, hell fire and then you don't do anything and that iniquity you don't want to continue. That's why you are saying that which I see not. Teach thou me if if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. And the Lord will help you to be obedient in Jesus' name. I come to point number three. A downward destination. In Jonah chapter one. Jonah chapter one. We're looking at verse three again. A downward destination. Jonah chapter one verse three. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and went down to Joppa and went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down again into it to go with them. Unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid. And cried every man unto his God. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship. Into the sea to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And he lay and was fast asleep. Chapter 2 verse 6. In chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. I went down. You will see that the path of disobedience is a downward journey. Instead of going up, instead of climbing higher, and instead of going on with the Lord, disobedience led him down and down and down. Until there was no hope, humanly speaking, for him. Can I show you some few other people that went down like that? And the result of going down was disastrous. In Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. Verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath. That's the beginning of his downfall. And saw a woman in chimneys of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have, I have seen a woman of chimneys in chimneys of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to why? Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren and among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down, going down, and going down, and going down. Then in verse 7, and he went down and talked with the woman 
and she pleased Samuel well, Samson well. Think about the path you are taking. If it's a path of disobedience, a path of deliberate, intentional disobedience, willful disobedience, it's a way down. You're going down. And then the result will be disastrous. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18, 2 Chronicles going down, going down, going down. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 1. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab, to Samaria. He went down. Watch these people that would leave the mountaintop of holiness and they leave the mountaintop of righteousness and instead of climbing higher every day, going higher every day, they're going down every day because they've seen something in the valley that they want to grab, they want to take. Look at verse 28. The result of Jehoshaphat going down, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramos Gilead. They're going back, they're going to battle now. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put on, put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to the battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save except only for the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots of Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel, because the king of Israel disguised himself. And Jehoshaphat that went down to Ahab, he was the one dressed as a king. Therefore, they compassed him about to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. And God moved them to depart from him. He got into trouble. They almost killed him. You say, but well, God delivered him. Look at the next chapter, chapter 19, verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Ananel, the seer, went out to meet him and said to king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore, is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Is going down, brought wrath. Against him, Jeremiah chapter 7. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 26. Jeremiah 7, verse 26. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ears, but hardened their necks. And they did worse than their fathers. Going down makes somebody to act worse than the people of old. God called Jonah and God said, Jonah, arise. Go to the city Nineveh and cry against it. The word I have given you. And that man went from bad to worse. And just kept on going down and going down and going down. Therefore, thou shalt speak all these words unto them. But they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. This is a nation that obeys not the voice of their God, nor receiveth correction. And you look at Jonah, when you go on in the story, in chapter 1, there was a great storm. And he knew that the great storm was because of him. And instead of kneeling down there saying, Oh God, stop the storm. I will obey you. 
and I will go to Nineveh. Once I come out of this trouble, I'll go to Nineveh and preach your word. He just told the people, I know the trouble is because of me, because I'm a servant of God. I'm trying to flee from an assignment I don't want to do. What are we going to do to you? Well, it's very simple. Take me up, throw me into the sea. I'll fight it with God. Throw me into the sea and leave me and God, and we will fight it out. He didn't understand. God is greater than man. I said God is greater than man. Don't fight against God. If he has called you, there is but one thing to do, just obey. Just obey, just obey. It's a message that comes to you, God's message. When he tells you what you do, there is but one thing to do, just obey. But we're told here, it says in verse 28, truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 12 and verse 13. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers. And there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. See, they will not receive favor because they were going down and down and down from disobedience to rebellion. We're told in Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 8. In Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 8. But thou, son of man, Hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. It says, let this moment be a moment of repentance. A moment of coming back to the Lord saying, Lord, I know what you are calling me to do. It is to arise and go into the city and declare the truth of the gospel unto the people. And be not rebellious like Jonah. Be not rebellious like the house of Israel. We will obey the Lord in Jesus' name. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Reading from verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 33. I'm reading to you from verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, that is to go astray, and to do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord has destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hack him. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the sons and bound him with fetters. And carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. And he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. That's exactly what happened to Jonah eventually. When he found himself in the whale's belly. And he was in affliction. And he saw it is not going to be to his advantage to fight against the almighty God. Then we're told, like this Manasseh, he humbled himself greatly before the Lord his God. And he prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him. And heard his supplication. And brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. That's the same thing the Lord is expecting from you today. That now, as you have seen, what happened to Jonah because of his disobedience? 
because of his rebellion. And the Lord said, Arise, go to Nineveh and cry unto each the word I've given you. And then Jonah went the other direction. And eventually, you know the story, a storm arose. And then after that storm, he went into the whale's belly in the sea. It was in that whale's belly, he began to cry to the Lord. He began to pray to the Lord. And then he renewed his vow again with the Lord and said, Lord, I will not do what you have called me to do. That's what God is waiting for. God is not interested in punishing anyone, oppressing anyone, afflicting anyone, or judging anyone. All that he's calling us to is to come back into obedience to the word of the Lord. And as we make up our minds, we're going to obey the Lord today. Every negative thing, he will reverse from our lives in Jesus name what was Jonah to do and what are you to do number one go there and warn them warn them as we go out today and then we're going back to our various communities the Lord is saying look at your mother look at your father and look at the people all around you, in your school, in your community, everywhere you find them, where you go, warn them. Number two, witness to them. That's the reason you are in the kingdom. Because you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. Witness to them. And whether if you find the sinners in church, witness to them. You find them in your place of work, witness to them. You find them where you are buying something, witness to them. Number three, wake them up. Wake them up with the bell of judgment and ring the bell loud and clear. Judgment is coming. All will be there who has rejected and who have refused. But tell them Jesus saves today. If they will call upon the Lord, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, weep over the erring one and tell them they don't need to perish. They can come to the Lord. Number one, you want them. Number two, you witness to them. Number three, you wake them up. Number four, you weep over them. You will go into your closet and you will go into your room and you will cry cry and you will weep and mourn like a dove and then you are praying for them interceding for them number five win them one by one you win them if you will talk to the one next to you and i will talk to the one next to me in no time at all will win them also win them one by one then your office or then your school or then your college, or then your community, or then your house. Anywhere you find them, win them one by one. And as they repent, and as they receive the Lord as their personal Savior, number six, welcome them into the kingdom. Welcome them. Embrace them. I don't mean physically. Accept them. Welcome them. Show them the church. Integrate them with the church and say, you are welcome. And then number seven, after you have welcomed them into the church, watch over them. That they are saved. Look at over this weekend from Friday to Saturday and to Sunday until this day. The people that have come to the Lord and we have welcomed them and we clapped and we rejoiced because they came to the Lord. Now the work is not over. Now we are to watch over them. Now they are in the kingdom at such a time like this. They might go through persecution and their old friends may try to pull them back. But because you are visiting them and you are watching over them and you are helping them and you are encouraging them, that is how they will stay. Remember when you were born again and then the persecution you went through the challenges you went through there was somebody that followed you up and they watched over you that's why you have remained in the church till this day what we have done for you and now that you are stable in the church you do for other people and the Lord will help you and the Lord will give you a reward if we will do this work of talking to the people and bringing them into the kingdom, watching over them, that they remain in the kingdom, the Lord will reward us, even in this life, and in eternity, in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we do it? Amen. I say, shall we do it? Yes. I will not be like Jonah. 
I will not be like Jonah. I will not be like Jonah. I will be like Jesus Christ. Because he came to this world to seek and to save that which was lost. I'll be like Jesus. I will not be like Jonah. Rise up and tell the Lord, really pray. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, I want to be like Jesus. Not like Jonah, not, not like Jonah. I want to be, I will be, I will be, I will be like Jesus. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Have you been disobedient to the Lord like Jonah? You're not telling other people. You are not warning them. You are not witnessing to them. Are you going to allow them to perish? Why don't you make up your mind today? Lord, I will not allow the fear of man to keep me away from doing the will of God. Doing the work of God will be obedient to the word of the Lord. Lord, I come to you. I give you my life. I give you my time. I give you my resources. You have called me. You have set a goal before me. And you have given me a work to do. Lord, it will be done. And I'm starting from today. I'm starting from this week. Make a commitment of your life to the Lord. Arise. Go. Go back home to your friends. And to family members. And tell them. What the Lord has done for you and what the Lord will do for them. Arise, go. Go preach the gospel to every creature in your home, in your community, in other provinces, in other local governments, in other towns, in other cities, in other regions, everywhere. Go, go and preach. Don't just sit down in the church. And it's not just walk in the church. Walk in the church is good. But there are more, there's more work outside than inside the church. More work inside outside than inside the church. Go out to the byways and the edges and the streets and plead with them and talk to them. Bring them in that the house of the Lord, the kingdom of God may be full. Witness to them. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's why you are in the kingdom. Tell them. Tell the poor sinner. The Savior has died for him. Wake them up. Don't allow them to sleep in their sin. Judgment is coming, all will be there. All who have refused, all who have rejected. Tell them, judgment is coming. There's a great day coming, there's a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Where will you be? Where do you spend eternity? Where you, will you be on that day? Wake them up. Let them know that judgment is coming. Let them know nobody will be able to endure when it comes. Weep over them, pray for them, intercede for them, talk to the Lord about them, that the Lord will soften their heart, that the Lord will make them receptive, talk to them. Weep over the erring ones, snap them in pity from hell, from death and the grave. He will forgive. If they only believe, rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for your labor, the Lord will grant unto you. Don't allow them to die. Commit yourself to the Lord. Lord, I will do it. Win them. Win them. Win them. Don't repel them. Don't drive them away. Don't use language that will repel them. Win them. Bring them to the Lord. 
the Lord is giving you a work to do. Be obedient to the commission, to the commandment of the Lord. And as they repent, and they give their lives to the Lord, and they yield unto the Lord, welcome them. Welcome them into the kingdom. Let them have a sense of belonging. Now they are saved. Now they are children of God. Welcome them into the kingdom. Take care of them. Visit them. Follow, up, follow them up. Teach them the word of God. Give them the bread of life. Give them the milk of the word that they may grow thereby. Welcome them. Then watch over them. Don't allow persecution to snatch them away from the Lord. Watch over them. Don't allow their problems to drown them, discourage them. Watch over them. Don't allow false prophets to snatch them away from the hands of the Lord. Watch over them. Be a good soul winner. Be a good shepherd. And don't allow them to be lost again. To go astray again after they have come to the Lord. Watch over them. The word of the Lord has come to you today. What are you going to do about it? You are saying, Lord, I will do what you have called me to do. Arise then, go, cry against that city, Nineveh. Go preach the gospel to every creature. 